Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'm Andrea Pirro. I'm the director of the Visiting Artists Program at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, and I am delighted to welcome you to this evening's lecture featuring celebrated painter Carmen Neely. I'd like to thank Carmen for taking the time to be here with us this evening to share her work and her expertise. I would also like to thank Marian Ibram Gallery for their assistance um, with this visit. SAC's Visiting Artist Program hosts a annual series of public talks by internationally recognized artists, designers, and scholars to expand our thinking about contemporary art and culture. In addition to public programs, our guests engage with SAC students through discussions, studio visits, and critiques. These are unique and highly valued experiences for our students, for which we're grateful to our visiting artists. Before the program begins tonight, I just have a couple notes about the format. First, please kindly silence your cell phones and note that recording of the talk is not permitted. At the end of the presentation, we'll have time to take a few questions from the audience before the program concludes by 7.30. Please raise your hand if you have a question and our staff will bring um, a microphone to you. We ask that if you're posing a question, if you could please keep it concise so we can try to get to as many questions as time allows. So thank you again for joining us tonight. And now I would like to welcome to the podium Lisa Wainwright, Chair of SAC's Painting and Drawing Department, as well as Professor of Art History, Theory, and Criticism. Thank you. Good evening. Painting is so hot right now. It's so hot right now. Or maybe it's always hot, right? I want to say painting is so hot right now again and again and again. I mean, maybe right now it makes sense given the otherwise mediated world of ubiquitous screens in our daily lives. We're hungry for the real stuff of painting, for the energetic texture of viscous colored marks or the de delightful precision of abutting graphic shapes. We're yearning to witness the hand of the artist, those humanist gestures of emotion and thought alchemically translated into central paint. And this is exactly what happens when beholding Carmen Neely's stunning work. With Neely, we enter a discourse of mark making, arabesques of linear abstractions that makes Space for our own empathic wandering. Like Mary Poppins, who you might recall, took the hands of her companions and magically jumped into a drawing to frolic in its illusion, Neely's paintings also beckon us to jump in, to experience another realm of sensorial consciousness. And when you do, when you jam with Carmen Neely in a Mary Poppins way, it's a glorious and incandescent ride. Neely comes from Charlotte, North Carolina, and holds a master's in fine arts from the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. She's represented by Miriam Ibrahim Gallery, so you might have seen her solo show last year, Sometimes a Painting is a Prayer, it was called. This followed a solo show in 2019 at Jane Lombard Gallery in New York, and another at Cetere Gallery in Dusseldorf. She's been in numerous group shows, including Una Brazzo in 2023 at Miriam uh, Ibrahim, Mexico City. If you forget my name, you will go astray in 2022 at Anna Egby, Los Angeles. What's it all about in 2021 at Jenkins Johnson Projects in Brooklyn. And in the same year, she was included in the New Americans the New Contemporaries, Volume 2, at Residency Art Los Angeles. And there are more. She's been represented in the Armory Show, Expo Chicago, Art Basel Switzerland, Art Basel Miami Beach, Paris Plus, the Barely Fair in Chicago, and the Prism Fair in Miami. And of course, recently, we saw a beautiful work in Michelle Grabner's 50 paintings at the Milwaukee Art Museum. And then a really cool item from her CV is that Neely participated in a panel hosted by Vice President, soon to be President, Kamala Harris. Uh, uh, Carmen was with uh, Thelma Golden, Carrie Mae Weems, and 
Glenn Ligon, good company. And Neely's forthcoming solo exhibition at Miriam Ibrahim will open in Paris in just a couple of weeks. She's on her way to Paris. Neely thinks of her paintings as a form of storytelling and uses the term narrative abstraction to describe the work. This idea and the work itself is in league with the history of art, with the history of painting. The automatism of the surrealist André Masson comes to mind. The graffiti-esque scribbling of Cy Twombly. The staccato rhythms of Julie Meretu, or the indexical work of our own dear professor of painting and drawing, Suzanne Doremus, whose work is currently on view at Zola Lieberman Gallery. And like Suzanne Doremus, Neely's work is personal, and so perhaps one might say feminist. Neely has described her experience of painting as, quote, permeated by eroticism, end of quote. And when her palette was hesitantly described as feminine, she countered that, quote, there is a power in identifying the color choices this way because the expansive visual language of femininity remains both overlooked and underestimated. You go, girl. Please join me in welcoming Carmen Neely to the School of the Art Institute's Visiting Artist Program. It's really nice to be in a room where I feel surrounded by familiar faces and friends um, and so many colleagues that I admire. I have to say that's the first time that um, I or my work have been compared to Mary Poppins. <laughs> but it actually is a really convenient segue um, to some background information I'd like to share as an entry point into the way that I think about my relationship to painting. Uh, this image is from my apartment, windowsill. My paternal grandmother collected salt and pepper shakers over the course of her adult life. I know that she had at least 100 pairs because I remember being in high school and all of them being on display in our local public library. Um, and I remember seeing them and feeling like they were really strange out of the context of her home. Uh, suddenly, these things that were really familiar to me um, as part of the backdrop of my family, shared dinners and holidays were out in this foreign atmosphere in a very vast public space in a lobby that was open air, three stories high, where people walked by and kind of overlooked them or could easily do so. Um, they perform differently here versus in her living room. And they still held her essence for me personally, but it was in a slightly muffled way in contrast to what I was familiar to. When she passed away, many family members divided up some of the salt and pepper shakers. And I remember feeling very passionate about acquiring these particular ones and several others that I couldn't include here. Um, they've moved around the country with me to various locations and have sat in many different cabinets um, and pantries of my own. And over time, I've started to add to this collection of objects and extend these things that belong to her. And they blend into my own personal life. I will never have full access to the entirety of these stories that are housed in these objects. They're extremely important to me because they're souvenirs of my grandmother's life. They are representative of her choices, her aesthetics, her relationships. They're symbols of anniversaries, birthdays, Christmases, moments when people thought of her and gifted her things that reminded them of her. These salt and pepper shakers 
can't share all the details for me, but they bring me as close as I feel I possibly could be to her many years after her passing and generations away from her lived experience. I rely on them in a particular way because I know my memory is flawed and it's malleable. It's influenced by context and time. So I'm grasping onto souvenirs as an attempt to record a kind of emotional detail that I can return to. My relationship with these embodied objects could be a symptom of just a hyperactive mind that needs cues and reminders to function, or it could reflect symptoms of a hyperactive, overstimulating world. Maybe both. One of my favorite writers, who is a scholar and poet, Susan Stewart, has this quote that, where she says, the present is either too impersonal, too looming, or too alienating compared to the intimate and direct experience of contact which the souvenir has as its reverent. This reverent is authenticity. What lies between here and there is oblivion. Avoid marking a radical separation between past and present. I think there's a lot housed in that short statement, but what I'm most drawn to about it is her use of the word oblivion, which is about the condition of forgetting or a state of being destroyed. It's a scary word. It's about loss. It's about the unknown. It's about a lack of control. And when I do situate myself in this uncomfortable gap in relationship to these objects, and I think about what I do and don't know about my grandmother, I have to engage with loss. I'm reminded of all of the instances where I didn't ask deeper questions or ask for more shared stories and the information that could have been available to me if I had inquired differently or engaged in different kinds of conversations with her. That is uncomfortable, but simultaneously, these objects are very generative for me. And sometimes I can just look at the ones on my shelf in my apartment and I can imagine smelling what her clothing smells like, or remember what the light looks like coming into her kitchen in the morning. This importance of seeking an idea of authenticity is sometimes described as related to our human need for clarity and certainty to soothe anxiety, to feel safe. In thinking about reaching for a feeling of authenticity and facing the possibilities and limitations of memory, of objects, and language, I'm led to imagine what painting and gesture can do when situated in the intimidating space of oblivion. The language of abstraction, which to me is also a language of longing, is one that feels intuitive. When many aspects of my own identity already place me in a state of both hypervisibility and simultaneous invisibility. There can be comfort in seeking catharsis, both in art making and viewing that approaches ambiguity. And I think that can be found in my practice, but catharsis is not what I'm seeking myself. I've instead come to realize that I'm trying to lean into the open, uncertain space around language in my work. The space of oblivion, where things are unclear, where things are unanswered, and the space between what's overtly legible. From the moment that I started a painting practice, 
I intuitively wanted to leave a lot of negative space around the activity that was happening with gestures and marks on the surface. I've over time understood this negative space as holding the same weight and value of what's positively happening on the surface with my marks and with the color and movement. To me, that space is never empty. In painting, what could de be defined as negative holds just as much significance as the presence of line, and they communicate with each other in a necessary balance and imbalance. Gestures performing over raw gesso or exposed linen are potentially vulnerable. And being able to see every step along the process of building a painting and adding marks, for me, I think, has a lot to do with the need to essentially lay bare things that feel honest and imperfect somehow in my retelling of experience. The paintings have never been planned. I am always using the canvas and everything that happens there as a way to capture response or reaction. And for probably the past four or five years, I've generally started with the title of the work and then used that as my cue, my emotional guide to lead me through embodiment. This archiving of conversations that I would have with people was a form of journaling. And I would keep so many written documents and notes everywhere throughout my life, sometimes typed, preferably written, um, in notebooks, in the margins of other people's books, my books, um, as post-its, trying to make sure that I had some reference point that would allow me to recall an emotional state at a later point in time. And all of these collective titles were my archive of relationships and potentially conversations that I did that I was afraid of losing, afraid of getting caught up in the space that I couldn't access in this oblivion. The relationship between oil paint and gesture Oil paint as gesture and written line resembling text is fluid for me. Their legibility or visibility undulates and the two languages are constantly bleeding into one another. In the summer of 2022, often I am in this archive of conversation and experience and journaling about my life processing things that are difficult and using the space of canvas and paper to do that. As another form of trying to access or capture what is felt in this negative space or a place of lack of clarity, I found myself trying to write about a healing from the loss of someone that I was close to. It was a breakup, um, the ending of a romantic partnership. And I found myself not being able to actively or accurately articulate with words the process or evolution away from these heavy feelings that I was carrying. So as an exercise, I started to list as a journal that summer all of the feelings that I knew I could name I didn't have that I wasn't carrying that day. So I had a list that evolved over time that showed a progression, but still somehow I was able to capture the lack of clarity that I even had about accessing my own healing and understanding things in real time. And so this is what these examples are from. I call these works the not paintings because they're a list of things that I knew, the only things I could name when I couldn't name what I actually was feeling. Around this time, 
The paintings also released what I think was an attachment that I had to the initial start of work with gesso and charcoal or graphite. So often, it's a bit like um, this reference to notation that I have that I would employ every time. There would be some traces of gesso sweeped across the surface, and I would write into that and make notes. And those notes would become almost like the skeletal structure for gesture and paint, interacting with them and translating them. Not erasing or concealing, but in dialogue. This work, L'Esprit de l'Escalier, comes from a French term that translates to the spirit of the escalator, or spirit of the staircase, sorry. And it is a description of what happens when you find the perfect words for something once the situation is completely passed and you can't return to it. So you've missed your opportunity um, to go back and say the right thing or do the right thing, and you're left holding this feeling of potential remorse or maybe embarrassment. For me, actually, a lot of the work is inspired by my own uh, grappling with unresolved feelings about relationship, shame, embarrassment, uncertainty. Sometimes I'm trying to find ways to grapple with the weight of tragic circumstances and balance that with some levity or humor. And notation, I think, could be a way to deal with the honesty of that being awkward um, in this detail for the painting Before It Destroys You, which came from a conversation where a friend warned me about my closeness to a partner. I thought, what if I make a joke to myself in this piece? and the painting can actively tell me to look out or watch out, and maybe I'll listen. <laughs> In other works, I'm employing materials that also reference drawing or writing, and oil sticks or, um, oil, sticks or oil pastels that seem to move as if they're crayons. Um, or drawing material, making notes, crossing out things, redacting lines that suggest thoughts I wish I could erase, thoughts that I wish could be clearer. Towards the end of the same year that I completed all of the work that I had just shown, I started preparing for the opportunity to have a solo exhibition, my first, here in Chicago and Mary and Ibrahim. Um, the show that Lisa referenced, sometimes a painting is a prayer. It was coming uh, at a really interesting time in my life because it was sort of approaching a marker of a space where I was settling into some stability for the first time in several years. I moved to Chicago in the summer of 2020 during the peak of the pandemic. Um, I left a job. I didn't have a plan other than to put everything that I could into painting here as long as I could survive it and make it work. Um, those following several years were very difficult for various reasons. A large one being that close to the time that I started to become stable, I also became diagnosed with an autoimmune illness. And it changed the way that I suddenly had to think about the possibilities of making. And again, my relationship to the space that I was dealing with. It forced me to slow down at a moment where I wanted to, because I felt I was just catching my stride, really run. And it felt appropriate to me to try to channel 
or embody all of that um, difficulty somehow in an exhibition that as this marker of a particular moment in my life could act as this cue to lead other people into potentially being close to what that feeling was for me at the time. And thinking about space, this was a step for me to consider how the installation of the work could then be an extension of the space that's allowed for and the space of the canvas. And so it felt apparent pretty early on that conceptually the show should be one work. It should take time or at least ask people to spend more time and invite them in, not only with its scale, um, that requires a kind of prolonged looking to be able to digest everything that's visually present, but that it's the only thing in the room and that a seat is provided to have quiet space alone with only this one thing to focus on. Something else that I could feel I was channeling and dealing with color on this completely raw canvas was how to approach adding the lines and the strokes in a way that felt like the painting was really coming out of the flesh of the surface. And this was the beginning for me really leaning more heavily into paint that in many instances, and which are difficult to pick up on pictures, depending on where you're situated in the room and the way the light reflects on the canvas, the color of the paint or the oil stick is so close to the color of the material that it can't be seen from every vantage point. This work felt like I was trying to encompass and basically describe the complexity of a very tumultuous series of years that housed a lot of pain and uncertainty alongside a story of success and joy and triumph and warmth and friendship. Um, having the space across five canvases to attempt to do that felt like it gave me room, but this title, Caught a Glimpse, also is some indication of the fact that I recognized it was, yes, a kind of release to process all of those emotions in one space, um, but also only what I can share is a particular slice of the fullness of everything that really was possessed in that time. The show felt very vulnerable and exposed for me because it, it felt risky to leave so much space that felt minimal in the canvas. And I, I know I had a history of before leaving a lot of negative solid white gesso and scratches and moments of the material of the canvas bleeding through in places, but it was intimidating for me to have a work that was so large and attempting to contain so much and leave so much room for bareness. Um, to, to correspond with 
the intimacy of that massive, soft work. I really wanted something that would provide another kind of close reading in the same exhibition. And so I embarked on this project of also for the first time retelling more explicitly what also was happening in my private journaling world with legible words. So I had a series of journals that I had written over the course of the year where I was diagnosed. And there were many that were me processing, dealing with a disconnection with my own body, a frustration with my pain, anxiety about the future and the uncertainty around not knowing if I was going, how I was going to manage this new element of my reality. And instead of just sharing them as typed messages, I felt like I needed them to exist in the world as in some material format that could mimic the way I believe or I hope that the paintings operate in the world. Somehow, being close to the way my grandmother saw pepper shakers operate for me. Like I have these things that are symbols that are particular because they were chosen, but they're still mediating. There's still a distance between what they represent for me and my experience with them. The closest I could get to potentially sharing my private journal pages with everyone that I meet or everyone I want to encourage in my life is to replicate them with as much care and intention as I possibly could. And to do that, I worked with um, a printmaking studio in Paris that very meticulously helped me create photographic lithographs of my journal pages that I had from that time. So we mimicked them down to the exact size, had the texture of the paper replicated. They made metal guides, which was so impressive, um, of all of the different edges where they were ripped out of the notebook. And they're exactly to scale and as close as possible to the real thing, but inevitably not quite so. Well, and that picture, I'm sorry if I should explain what that is, also in case anyone's not really um, sure about lithography or printmaking processes, these are examples of how they were constructed, basically a, a layer of that titanium buff color, or that beige color was put down first, run through a press, and then other brown ink was laid over to mimic the texture of paper, and then another layer of ink was run through a giant press with just my handwriting. And then they were all ripped individually along that edge as a guide to mimic the same page. Alongside this show, there were continuous pieces that were revolving texts taken from these journal entries, taken from my um, feelings of being completely contorted, completely um, confused and turned upside down. And I reflected this at, during this period, I think in the ways that I embraced text a little more boldly or a little differently in the paintings themselves. So thinking about the ways that text can glow or burn um, or echo. How it can disappear, 
how it can be webbed together or woven. And then as a contrast to where I kind of started earlier on in 2021, before all of these things were happening, um, the evidence is there and it's still very much related to the work that I'm doing now. I think there are consistent threads that have remained throughout the entire process. And what changes for me with every body of work is how to expand right, the variations of dealing with space, um, the emptiness, and the relationship between text and gesture. I've given myself the freedom in the past year to edit my kind of hard rule about starting with um, the titles that are taken directly from conversations, directly spoken words. Um, and I really liked the parameters that that gave me and having these kind of hard boundaries to essentially hold myself accountable, which is an interesting thing to think about in a process of making that's so intuitive and needs so much flexibility and needs organic expression to kind of deal with or approach honesty or authenticity. Um, I think that we all as artists, even within those freedoms, are trying to give ourselves kind of rules or tasks to hold ourselves accountable to, to remain true to whatever that definition of like what's real is for us. But I've given myself space, I think with the release of this need to rely on a kind of truth telling with the title being so specific, to be more playful. Um, this piece, Dance with One Person and Everybody at the Same Time, uh, came from a silly story uh, that I experienced at a party where I basically initiated a lot of gossip about myself and another person because I was dancing very closely to someone. And afterwards, I had an entire conversation with a friend about how I was doing it wrong. I was doing the social public dancing wrong. And I didn't know that that was a thing and that you could do it wrong. But apparently, if you want to avoid gossip, you dance with everybody in the room all at once. You don't dance with one person. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's like after coming out of so much, not that the only thing that I paint about is heartbreak, right? And like my health, but I think that there has to be space for everything. And I think that some of the most compelling works that I've really witnessed in person and that I've gotten the privilege to it experience, we're able to manage grappling with these juxtapositions in the same space and asked me or required me to kind of address or deal with my own dichotomies. So um, another piece that I love that's also a funny story. Uh, like an elephant on a tricycle, which I think in some places is a common expression, but I never heard before, describing something that's just extremely out of context and doesn't belong. This diptych, that thing you do when you're talking yourself, 
out of something versus the thing you do when you talk yourself into something. Is also me thinking about the ways that paintings can be didactic in a comical way. Um, me making notation again and also giving instruction in a way that's meant to be playful, but also still serious about its embodiment. And ultimately, I'm still rearranging and exploring how all of the elements of constructing a painting can be juxtaposed, can be contradictory in the same space, can be rearranged. And ultimately, the work for me is if it's situated in the space of not knowing and leaning into the discomfort of that as it archives my own existence, it's really so much about asking questions. Um, and so I wanted to end on a note with some of the current questions that I'm dealing with now in my practice, in the work, in my life, that potentially I will keep asking in perpetuity, but that I'm still pursuing. The first one being that I think about excessively lately every time I am bombarded by current events of the world. How do I reconcile feelings of insufficient size in the scale of the world's needs? What new possibilities for commune occur when I've accepted the most terrifying parts of myself? While situated in oblivion, how can painting act as an effective conduit for these questions? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. We have time for a few questions from the audience. If you'd please raise your hand and then someone will get a microphone over to you. Keep your questions concise and to the point so we can get to as many as possible. Thank you. Hello. Okay. Um, hi, I really liked your presentation. Um, I had a question about the materials. So you said that the canvas is unprimed. Is it, when, when you say unprimed, do you mean like you actually just get the linen and then you start painting on it? Or, because you know, like oil on top of unprimed. Yes, that's a good question. And I did intend to specifically address this, but there is a clear gel medium between the linen and the oil paint. Yes. Audrey. Hi, yeah, I just wanted to get, um, de dive a deep, deeper into the second um, question that you've asked, uh, the possibilities of commune occur when you've accepted the most terrifying parts of yourself. Mm -hmm. um, can you elaborate on that? Um, is it that, you know, it's once you find your own personal horrors, are you afraid nobody's gonna connect any longer? Or maybe I'm reading too much into it, I'm not sure. Oh. I think it's, okay, if I understand your question, I think that um, the question I'm posing is potentially assuming or asking what's the, the opposite of this, right? Like actually by exposing and leaning into the parts that I'm afraid to really see in the mirror that I actually will find other people in the world, right? Co the commune will be found in 
learning that I'm not the only person who has these terrors, who also possesses these demons or, you know, whatever it is that I'm evading or hiding from. I'm sorry, I'm just going to go a little bit deeper into that. So um, you're feeling, um, and perhaps this is the case when you find that commune, um, it's, uh, uh, does it give you more force for um, diving deep in, into it? And um, then the fear perhaps becomes less terrifying? I think I can point to more specifically as an example, those journal entries that were very directly legible from my last show and how fearful I was to just be sharing that much about my insecurity through those writings, and there were five of them. Um, and they were me expressing in what originally was just a private moment talking to myself, something not that I was expecting to be shared on a large public scale, and then later considering that there was something I could gain from allowing that part of myself to be seen, hoping that other people could recognize themselves in it and that I would feel a bit held by that and feel supported even by strangers and in a very powerful way that is the sentiment that carried through response through the exhibition. And I think it's just as, it's just as difficult um, to, to put something outward like that that's so private and, and vulnerable, even when you may not have direct contact with everybody who is, who is digesting it and engaging it, it's like a knowing that you're really, you're being very seen and you can't, um, once it's there, you can't kind of shield it or it's, it's out of your control, it's a release of control that is just as, I think, intimidating or scary as directly having a conversation face to face with someone who's gonna give you an immediate reaction or respond, I think, because then there's like this not knowing. You're like, oh, do I, does this sound like a weak person? And that's, you know, I did feel weak in that moment. And is, is that gonna be a lingering thought or is, is, is that um, a part of me that I wanna have like archived in the world or all of these, thoughts, all of that stuff comes up. <laughs> um, and so yeah, the, the commune I think is, is through that kind of like release, that, that activity is what I'm really thinking about and referring to. Elizabeth. Hi. Um. I understand throughout your presentation, a lot of your work is just based on capturing, like you said, like tumultuous times in your life, coupled with very important, very gratifying moments in your life as well. But I imagine during the process of creating, it brings up a lot of heavy emotions and I'm asking, how do you keep yourself grounded when at times maybe too many feelings can be brought up or you weren't expecting a reaction in the way that you were while you were creating? Mm. That's a really great question. Um, and it, it makes me think about how also in developing a practice, um, it becomes important to know for yourself when it feels safe for you to release things into the world or to share them with other people. And some things happen and they are just for you and they require time. And maybe that time is only yours and for your eyes. And maybe that's true indefinitely, or maybe it just needs, you know, 
a duration before it feels that you also are in a place where you're comfortable releasing it beyond your studio. Um, so slowness, I think, is really necessary. And the work, I'll, a lot of us are like processing through making, and, but I, I don't believe that that's where it ends. And I, I try to, I also recognize like depending on where you are and what's happening, um, maybe you have deadlines, maybe you're in a rush to complete things for an exhibition or for a project or for someone else or for something else outside of like what you really need personally from the work. Um, but it's really, important to hold on to the control of that space and your time that you need to process after something is produced. Yeah. Thank you. Laura. I've got a question about, um, and first of all, I, was, I just love your work. I just love its freedom. And I, and I love the feeling that comes out of it, and I, and I love the, um, the meticulous uh, palette that is also very subtle. And it gives it a lot of, uh, a lot of richness, I think. But my question is, in, in transposing this experience that you may have at a party or with something painful in your experience or feeling awkward or what it might be in, in a given case, did you develop a toolbox or is there any way you could share with us that process from that experience onto the cathartic, as you, as you call them, the cathartic brush strokes that you choose in trying to get that on your linen. You have this experience, and then when you're making these brush strokes, these choices have to come in from this experience, and is that something that you feel you've developed and can you do better now? When you first try to say, I'm gonna make this painting about this experience, it's not easy. And so did you develop a toolbox to be able to convey that more effectively, or do you think that that's something you've always had? Mm, I think that it's a little bit of both. I think with rehearsal and time, for sure, I want to believe that I'm a much better painter today than I was, you know, like eight years ago. <laughs> I want to believe that I'm evolving and growing and that I absolutely am learning from every work that I make in every series, I, the, those processes teach me something. Um, but also, there's an element, I mean, for me, and thinking about the ways that I try to access authenticity or like truthfulness um, and maintain it in the work is the directness. So there's not a, a, a planning, like I mentioned, of what something is gonna become before um, the incident of it, you know, being documented, or me writing, and our, our mark making. Um, so there is a high level of, I guess, risk involved in that, because at the same time, I am constructing, you know, an image. I'm thinking about the relationship between color, and I am thinking about the formal qualities of the painting and how, how it progresses. Um, and so completing the work and it being successful is a balance of it effectively doing something formally that's connected to the embodiment of, right, an emotional experience. So it's balancing two kind of different things at the same time and making successful work um, based on those parameters, I think, yeah, it just, it happens over time, or it doesn't. Um, not necessarily every painting I make, I think, is a successful painting that then I share with anyone else. Like, maybe it's just the thing that archives something that happened, and it's also not effective formally. And um, so the risk of that happening is always present. So it also kind of demands that, each choice is made with a lot of intention and awareness and presence. Each brush stroke? Yes, yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth. Hi, 
Hi, um, I know you mentioned oil sticks and oil pastels. For applying the paint, are you using anything other than brushes? Um, sometimes there are things that are rubbed, like sponges, um, hands, fingers, uh, paper, but mostly, mostly brushes and then drawing material. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth. Hi. Um, you kind of already went into this, but it's kind of more of a question about your um, artistic practice. But I was just, I wanted to hear more of your thoughts about it. And my question was, I guess, what is your motive behind like choosing to use line and like the absence of space rather than a more like visually understandable style to the viewer? And like, you know, what do you like about doing that? I'm curious about the description of visually understandable understand of, can you repeat that and explain to me what you mean by that? I guess what I meant by that is, you know, looking at your work, I think the viewer, especially if you don't read the titles, you have to think a lot more about what that means to you. And then once you read the title, you have a different outlook on it. So I guess if you look at the piece by itself without the title, you may not exactly relate those two things. And then once you read the title, you have to take a second look at it. So I guess that's what I meant. Um, yeah, I think that my interest in, in text, so lines that reference text and language, um, and incorporating them into painting is that it's also pulling from something familiar that usually gives us a very direct cue. Um, and for me and thinking again about leaning into the discomfort of trying to access um, parts of memory, parts of myself, communicate and connect with other people between this space of you know, disconnect, just the distance that exists even when we're really working hard to understand each other, acknowledging it um, and making in a way that is representative of that, to me, is effective through ab abstraction. Um, and so, yeah, in the same way that, you know, I think it's generative for imagination and requires us to kind of work to think about assumptions and fill in the gaps and question the things that we know and what we're, and what we don't know, I, I, respect and appreciate that power of the language of gesture and painting to do that. Thank you, mm -hmm. love your work. <laughs> Thank you. Audrey. Hi, thank you so much for coming out and speaking tonight. Um, my question is mainly out of curiosity. You mentioned a lot how storytelling finds itself within your work, and I guess my question is based on the fact that when I think of storytelling, I think of a fluidity and of a movement, um, especially with when it comes to standalone paintings and pieces such as paintings, sculptures, etc. I think it's, um, I guess it's looked at more commonly as stagnant. My question for you is, would you say, is there a fluidity between your work, as in, are you working on multiple pieces at the same time? Do your works influence each other, or would you say they're more standalone, and each piece is a you know, start and end of a story in and of itself? Um, it can depend on what's happening in my life at the time. And, Things that feel very um, like full and large, and if I have the capacity, also just my my own emotional capacity at the time to work on many pieces at once that can be in dialogue with one another, then I attempt to do that. Um, and then in other ways, when something is very, I mean, the massive painting that I made that was the five panels long, that was really the only thing that I was working on at the time. Um, 
and then other more specific works that were sometimes addressing just my the physical issues that I was having when I got my initial diagnosis and the fact that I was slower in general. My ability changed, my mobility changed. Um, so that it, it's never really kind of one thing and I'm constantly trying to go with the flow of what feels organic and what feels, um, yeah, like it allows me to access the, the most truth. So I try not to stretch that across many works if it feels like it's pushing and I'm kind of like ad-libbing on a thought or filling in the gaps of my memory where they're not really present. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah. Elizabeth. Hey, Carmen. <laughs> um, oh, hi. I, uh, as you know, I love titles and I love the titles of your work. And I'm curious because some of them are idioms or common phrases that you might see. A lot of these are niche, so things that you wouldn't necessarily hear unless you're talking to someone very poetic. But I'm curious if you've oh. encountered the same uh, phrase in, in different conversations over different periods of time. And if you've had the same impulse to want to paint it, but from a different feeling or from a different memory. I don't know if that makes sense. Oh, yeah, no, okay. that's a good question because I've been waiting for that to happen and <laughs> it hasn't yet. I'm sure inevitably that it will, but um, no, I have been, and, and I think maybe it's something to be said for writing down and marking the things that stand out to me because because they're, they're novel, or right? Like it's some, a phrasing that I hadn't heard before. And so that's why I'm accumulating these things that are all very different right now. But it's like, inevitably I'm gonna run into repeated phrases and other versions of conversations I've already had before. And I, yeah, I look forward to making that work and then being able to reflect on those different stages in my life. We have time for a couple more questions. Hi, Carmen. I love your works. So my question is, um, what are the tools that made you understand abstraction and gesture making, especially in the learning process of conveying your feelings? What are the tools that, sorry? Made you understand abstraction and gesture making, especially in the learning process of conveying your feelings? I, I really do, I really do think I'm uh, returning to the, the thought about being, um, hyper-visible and simultaneously invisible, this idea of grappling with many parts of my identity, being like very overtly black, being overtly a black woman in many spaces, being seen as that initially, being misunderstood um, in that context or uh, projected onto or misinterpreted um, and carrying a knowing of like being able to see myself in a space, like to step outside and see myself um, communicating um, or not being communicated well and also knowing what is happening within my own body that like the awareness of that disconnect is inherent to the way I've lived my life and that's what I was implying and trying to say when I talked about the fact that it felt intuitive, this language of dealing with contradictory experiencing or truths being housed in the same space. Like ultimately, um, multiple realities or perceptions being present at the same time is part of just like the language and nature of gesture and abstract painting or abstract imagery, like it feels comfortable for me also to be in that 
weird space and, and trying to make sense of it as I'm in it because I've also lived that in other ways as a, as a human, as a person. I hope that answered the question. Elizabeth. Hi, Carmen. Earlier in the introduction, there was a mention of someone saying that your color palette was overtly feminine. Where do you reach, or what, how do you find your color inspiration to build your color stories, and are there things that you are just not interested in working with as far as colors are concerned? Hmm. That's, in that's interesting to think about things that I'm definitely not interested in. Um, because really the choices feel dictated to, to me by their relationship to content. And I recognize that I still have a cohesive palette and I have had one across an extended period of time. Um, but even getting to the point where, like with these works in the recent years, that they're completely bare uh, fabric as the backdrop for the painting, I really could not have predicted that this is where I would have landed, at, uh, this is where I would be um, at the past. And I think it just, the painting started to feel like they needed to hold themselves together differently as I was also holding myself differently in my own body. Like thinking about fragility and, and new ways to approach addressing it in my work led to this kind of bareness and this kind of particular space. And so then the color of this particular cotton linen blend of canvas started also influencing the palette that I'm using that's in dialogue with that as a backdrop versus the white. And so it, it kind of has, it's been a natural progression across like evolving content. And um, yeah, the show that I have opening in three weeks, I can't really like share or talk about because no one has seen the work yet, but it's another kind of massive shift, um, completely dictated again by like what's happening for me right now in my life. Um, so it's taken me to different color relationships that I also wouldn't have predicted, but are necessary to tell the stories I need to tell right now. Elizabeth. Hi, Carmen, Prachi this side. So my question is like, it's more about the process of like process when you do an artwork is like, do you take long pause between like, between the process of completing an artwork? Like for example, if I want to do an artwork, like if I have a canvas in front of, my, in front of me and like, and I'm half done, do you take like a, an hour to just see where I'm heading or like, let me let let me get done with this painting and let's see how it uh, let let just see how it turns out i think you're you're asking about time the time that it takes to complete a work and uh maybe just like what it requires to finish one or yeah just like yeah it's it's about time but it's more about because when when we do a work which is like highly emotional and like vulnerable do you do you like in like do you take a pause in between the art uh, like in between completing the artwork yes most i don't think um they they do they are created in this kind of burst of energetic movement and activity um but i don't really complete works in a singular sitting. And so there is space that I take throughout the process of completing a piece. Um, 
and it's a delicate balance of also not taking up too much space to still feel really connected to not just like the narrative, but what's happening in the moment in the retelling of the story and the, the relationships with the, the marks. So it is, and it, it's, it's an organic kind of call and response between myself and the painting. Like I have to listen, I have to, to react, I have to give it what it needs. Um, and so, yeah, I think that also relates to this idea of the ways that I have to be present when I show up to, to paint. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, everybody.